Sorry, I mixed things up a little bit this morning. I, I like to play my violin. It sort of tries to convince me I'm not scared. <laughs> I've heard it, heard it said that the ability to pick another's brains is a sign of intelligence and I'm not wanting to um, claim to any great degree of intelligence this morning but I do want you to realise that I am picking other people's brains. So uh, a lot of what I'm saying um, I've got from other people. Uh, that, that gives it a measure of authority that you might not hear from me. Um, yeah. If you've heard this material before, I make no apology because I've found that I'm greatly benefited by hearing something over and over again. So I'm sure it's not going to hurt you if you have heard it before, but I know many of you probably haven't. It always helps, you know, when you are going on a journey to know where you're going. I don't know whether you've ever tried to set out on a journey you don't know where you're going you don't know when you've got there do you but um okay so let me tell you right now we're going to be talking about creation and evolution and uh yeah i want you to understand that i believe that i've got to be careful which book i i pick up here but i believe that this book is the inerrant word of God from cover to cover. And uh, I believe that God created this world as we know it, or not quite as we know it, and we'll have a look at that later on. He created this world somewhere around 6,000 years ago, and 4,400 odd years ago, he destroyed it in a flood. My aim this morning is to reinforce your belief in the Genesis account of the creation. Now it's very important what you believe, uh, particularly when it comes to the creation account. The um, Jesus, Peter, Paul, they all referred to the creation. They believed in it. So if I choose to believe anything other than the six-day account as it's given in Genesis, then I'm doubting their word. And you start to question then in your mind other things that they say. And eventually you'll, you'll take the scriptures away from yourself, in effect, and you'll just become one of the world. So it's very important what you believe. It's also important what you believe as far as the creation account is concerned because the Sabbath, the sanctity of marriage, the authority of God all have their foundation in the, in the Genesis account of creation. So it's very important. If you believe something other than the six-day account, then the Sabbath has no meaning. You'll see that in a moment. The sanctity of marriage, well, you might as well forget about that. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit, I feel, on the crude side, but there's a song on the radio that says, you and I are just like mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. And you can assess that for yourself. It's talking about free sex. That's the result of believing in something else other than uh, the fact that God created the world. The authority of God. God no, has no authority in your life. He didn't make you. So why should you be interested in, in, in him in any, any way? If on the other hand, God made us, as Genesis says, and as I believe he did, he has rules for us to live by. We've broken those rules. There's a judgment to face. But Jesus has died for us. We have to decide. We've got a decision to make. 
as to whether we accept what Jesus has done for us. It may seem strange at first to say that I want to reinforce your belief in the Genesis account to want to talk about evolution. But that's what I'm going to do. It's probably a, a political ploy. You take down the opposition before you, yeah, you hear it in Parliament all the time. But that's what we're going to be having a look at. The reason for that is evolution speaks with such great authority. I, um, I went into, uh, I was loaned a magazine. I was very interested because right on the front cover was a picture of something I'll mention a little bit later. And it said 70 million years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they speak with such authority they actually bury their claims in long periods of time. I remember somebody who I used to hear speaking quite often and they would say something like this. I remember it well. It was a wet afternoon, Thursday afternoon, the 5th of January, 1909. I can't dispute that. I wouldn't have a clue. He's probably right. He might also be telling me a big story. <laughs> and that's what I feel, uh, I feel evolution does. It buries things that are not observable anyway, buries them in long periods of time. I believe that, that evolution is phony. It's a lie. And, uh, yeah, that's why we're going to be talking about it. Peter said that the people, the evolutionists, he didn't use the word evolution, but he said that they are willingly ignorant. And I, I remember when I was researching material for this talk this morning, um, seeing a photograph or a short video snap of a creationist and an evolutionist who were going to a, uh, an archaeological site. And they were, the creationist was particularly interested in this one, and I've forgotten what it was, because it was supportive material for the creation point of view. And... Um, the evolutionist was standing with his back to what they were doing. He never looked once. They called for him, come and have a look at this. He chose, he was willingly ignorant. He knew the material was going to be supportive, he didn't want to see it. That's incredible. That's not science. But first of all, before we do that, I want to have a look at our Bibles. It's interesting, it's interesting that some of our Bibles teach error. Did you know that? Open your Bible to the Genesis account. You've got one there. You won't see it so much in Genesis 1.5. That's the first text where it is... It says at the end of the text, the, the first day. All right, there was evening and there was morning, the first day. But you'll notice it in verse 8 if there's any variation. What do you see at the end of verse 8 in your Bible? Has anybody got something other than the first day? A second day, I mean. Yeah, anybody got something other than the Second day. Well, that's good. That's good. I bought myself a nice Bible, <laughs> and I've held it up in here a few times, and said it's you know a fantastic Bible. I feel disappointed in it. I've put it aside, and I've gone back to my old King James version because of what it says, and I, I won't take the time to open it. But it, it, instead of saying, it says the first day, in verse 5, it says evening, more, there was evening and there was morning. The first day says the, very definitely. But when it comes to verse 8, it says the second day. Uh, 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 sorry, I've got the wrong notes in front of me. 
it says a second day. All right. Now you tell me how many a how many a days are there? How many is there? There's an infinite number, isn't there? But if it's the first day or the second day, it's a definite day. And in the original language in the Old Testament there, it's the definite article that's used. There's no question about it. And you can see what can happen if you start off with evening and morning the first day, and then the next time you say a second day, it allows for a whole lot of time in between. And some, some Christians have wanted to mix the Genesis account with evolution. And so they, they've written, they've given us the, the Genesis account in that form. It starts off the first day, and then it's a second day, a third day. And that allows for what they call the gap theory. There's millions or billions of years between the first day and a second day. When you get down to the end of the week, what's going to happen with the Sabbath? Hmm? The Sabbath becomes a second day. It doesn't matter then what day you keep. It doesn't matter anymore. And that's why I say some Bibles actually teach error. This, this other Bible here, that, that, that one I was showing you actually has the, the allowance there for the gap theory, as it's called. And this one here, the, you probably won't, won't be too many here who have the Revised Standard Version, and this Bible doesn't actually have a reference column in it, but if you've got a Revised Standard Version with a reference column, it, it says the same sort of wording as in this Bible, but they are allowing for, if you look down in the margin, there'd be a letter, a letter against um, day. You look down in the margin and it says a long period of time. So that's a Bible that's allowing for a thousand year period for a day. All right, your Sabbath's going to be a heck of a long time. <laughs> a thousand years in your Sabbath. You can see the incorrect renderings that are given by those two Bibles. Okay, let's have a look at some of, some of the, the sort of things that evolution teaches. It starts off this way. A long time ago, and that starts to sound like a fairy story, doesn't it? A long time ago. And it's a fairy story, all right? It has no ending. A long time ago, in, in fact, 18 to 20 billion years ago, that's a long time, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was collected into one place. It spun around, it spun faster and faster and faster until it exploded. And the fragments of that heap of matter went off into, the, into space, becoming planets, suns, other worlds, our world, our moon, our sun. At first the earth was molten, a molten mass. But over a period of millions of years it gradually cooled until about 4.6 billion years ago when it cooled down to just a rocky crust. Over the next few million years, rain fell from time to time, dissolved the rocks and formed great oceans. And then about 3 million years ago, the first simple self-replicating cell emerged out of this primordial slime <laughs> soup. Okay. Sound good to you? There's all sorts of questions you need to we need to be asking the evolutionist at this point. He says this is how things began. Where did the matter come from? 
Where did all the matter come from? And it's interesting that when this was first proposed, not so many years ago, the Big Bang Theory, the mass of material that they said was turning round and round and round was 12 trillion light years across. That's a big heap of matter. By 1965, they said that body was 275 million light years. It's come down a lot. 1972, it was 71 million light years. 1974, it was down to 54,000 miles. And more recently, it had reduced to a trillionth of the diameter of a proton. And then it didn't exist. For some people said the Big Bang didn't happen at all. Some still believe it and teach it. Another question to ask, and where did all the energy come from for the, the explosion? Explosions don't occur without an input of energy. Where did that come from? They don't know. They don't know where the matter came from either. Then there's a law of the conservation of angular movement and momentum. If you've got a body that is spinning around and it spins fast enough for fragments to come off it, the fragments that come off will continue travelling away but spinning in the same direction. So if the original body is spinning in a clockwise direction, any pieces that break off it will spin, keep spinning in a clockwise direction. The question you need to ask in evolution is that why do two planets spin backwards? Why do six moons spin backwards? They don't know. With an explosion like that, you'd expect that matter would be distributed evenly throughout space, but it's not the case. There are huge gaps in space. And then other places where planetary bodies are, are closer together. The Earth's surface was not molten. If you have a look in Genesis 1-2, and you've probably got your Bibles still open there, it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the, what? Waters. It was never a molten surface. And if, if there was waters, they had to be less than 100 degrees Celsius, otherwise they'd, they'd have been steam, not water. And then there is the polonium halos. Have you heard of those? Polonium halos. Polonium is a radioactive isotope and has a half-life of less than, well, half-life of a few minutes. As it decays, it leaves a halo in the granite. If the, if the granite was molten, it won't leave the halo because its half-life is too short to wait for it to cool down. So there'd been, a, and scientists uh, uh, have been studying for years these polonium halos that occur in granite all over the world. How did they get there? It couldn't have been a molten surface. Someone has dared to say that they got there by fiat, was the word he used by fiat. What would that mean? Okay. Any teachers? I had to look it up in the dictionary. It's all right. The meaning of fiat is authorization, decree, order. Does that sound familiar? How did the polonium halos get into the granite? In our Bible it says, and God said, and it was so. And there was evening and morning, the day, and he said it was good. Okay? God spoke the granite into existence. And in that instance, those halos were formed.
Yeah, they, they couldn't. Yeah, so it's, it's all those halos formed within three three minutes, four minutes, a very short time period. And when the evolutionist talks about simple self-replicating life forms coming out of the primordial soup, a single cell organism is more complex than a space shuttle. And they're pretty complex. It would have taken a volume to record the gene pool information contained in that single cell self-replicating organism. It would take a thousand volumes to record the information from the human gene pool. A thousand volumes. It's just impossible. Nothing like the evolutionist says ever happened. How many of you ladies wanting to bake a cake would think of just tipping all the ingredients out on the bench and, and, and walking away? How many have made a cake like that? I could have well imagined if my boss asked me to build a switchboard and I just put all the components on the top on the workbench and then walked away, I know exactly what he'd be saying. If there is design, there has to be a designer. There has to be a designer. It's, it's unintelligent to think otherwise. It just doesn't happen any other way. Design requires a designer. The evolutionist talks, likes to talk about the Grand Canyon in Arizona and the United States because they, in the Grand Canyon you've got the Colorado River running through the bottom of the canyon and they say that the, the Colorado River has carved out the canyon over millions of years. And of course it looks pretty impressive because you've got all those layers there as well. But that's not true. It's simply not true. If you have a look at the mouth of the Colorado River where it enters the Californian Gulf, there is no delta. And all major rivers carry silt with them. And usually build a delta in the mouth of the river. There is no delta, or there's very little delta at the mouth of the Colorado River. In fact, I was surprised when I looked it up on the internet uh, to find that there's a lot of research and investigation going on as to how they can build up a delta because the Colorado River has various nations who are tapping water out of it and so there's not much left by the time it gets to the Gulf. But um, yeah, I was interested to find that it's just not true. The canyon is 277 miles long. It's 18 miles wide at its widest place, four miles wide at its narrowest, and it's 1,800 metres deep. That's quite a bit of dirt you'd have to shovel out to form the canyon. And you'd expect that that would be at the mouth of the, the Colorado River. It's simply not there. In fact, I don't know whether I've got the picture right in my mind, but the Colorado River actually flows in at the low end of the canyon and flows out at the high end. It's round the wrong way. For it to have carved the canyon out, it's round the wrong way. It's flowing the wrong way. And, um, yeah, it, it didn't carve out the canyon. It's actually a breach dam. After the flood, there may have been a, a, a huge lake there in the hills. And something has given way with that volume of water. It's rushed out of the canyon, carrying with it all the sedimentation and leaving the layers as we see it today. It's interesting too that those layers are nice and straight. There's no uh, uh, indication of uh, drainage at all. If they've been sitting there for millions of years, you, you would see places where water had rained and water had drained through. They're nice and straight. There's nothing like that at all. 
They, that, that probably happened not a long time after the flood, but it was probably formed in a matter of a few weeks. It's a breach dam. I thought I didn't have enough material. <laughs> Yeah. Do you mind if I keep going? <laughs> okay. Uh, you've probably heard of the geologic column. Heard of the geologic column? Some of you have. Okay. It's interesting that it, it occurs nowhere in the world but in textbooks. That's the only place where it occurs. It was drawn up in 1830 before there was any knowledge of dating. Yet it's still used in textbooks today. The bottom layers in the ge geologic column were said to contain the simple life forms. And as you went further up through the geologic column, the, uh, the uh, life forms that you found in there, in the way of fossils, were of as ascending order. So you'd expect to find the likes of us fossilised in the top layer. The... Um, some of the little creatures will show you shortly down in the bottom layers. It's simply not true. In real life, it doesn't occur that way at all. Sim the simple and the complex are most times mixed. Someone has said almost as if life began suddenly. And I'll read an interesting note about that later on. And this is, is just what Genesis tells us. In the beginning, God created one moment it wasn't there, the next moment it was. It's exactly what we see. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. I must mention this. There are variations that occur in nature that are mistakenly referred to by evolutionists as microevolution. See, you've got microevolution and you've got macro evolution. Macro evolution is when you see a dog evolve into a horse, for example, which has never happened. And you won't ever see it. It will never happen. That's macro evolution. But micro evolution is talking about variations that occur within a kind. Okay, and we see it in particular with dogs. There's a huge variety of dogs, thousands of different dogs But they are all of one kind, and, and the variation that you see, the, the differences that you see are only variations. A dog will never become a horse. Genesis 1:24 and 25 says, "And God said, "Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind." The evolutionist has been looking ever since. Darwin and his cronies first thought about these things. They've been looking for missing links. They've been looking for links between one kind and another kind. They've not found it. Any variations that occur within a species always result in a loss of genetic information. A variation never results in a gain of, a, of genetic information. In other words, and this might be a bad example, you are most unlikely to be able to breed a Great Dane from a Chihuahua. The genetic information required to do that is no longer available. It has been lost. A leading evolutionist, and I was very interested in this, has said that the only way evolution can work is for a favourable variation to occur, followed by selective breeding. And in view of the fact that Variations almost always result in a loss of genetic information. Any advancement is impossible. Evolution never has and never will happen. Charles Darwin himself said, if my theory is right, intermediate life forms will be found. And in his later life, he bemoaned the fact that they hadn't. And yet they still go on teaching it. Some modern evolutionists have conceded that they don't have any fossilised remains of ape men. That's the missing link. 
They don't have any fossilised remains of eight men, although they've been teaching for many years that they do. All they have is fossilised remains of extinct apes or fossilised remains of extinct humans. I want to leave, leave evolution now and show you something a bit more interesting. I see some of you going to sleep. <laughs> we want to have a look at some fossils. The children could try this out. Could say, one of the children tell me what that is? And most of the ones that are here. Scorpion. It is. Try the next one. What's that? A fish, yeah, okay. What's that? Some of the older kids. <laughs> what is it? Well, it could be a prawn, something in that family. It could be a, a, a lobster, crayfish, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah, they all look a little bit similar. It's probably, uh, what's that one there? Starfish. Even I know that one. Next one. What have we got there? What's that? Spider. Okay. Snake. Somebody say a snake, yeah. Keep going. We might have to reduce these, Bill. <laughs> What's that one? It's a fish, isn't it? What's that? Dragonfly. Yeah. Okay, what's that? That's a finger. A fossilized finger. Okay, that's another dragonfly. What's that? That's a fossilized tree. It's not quite so easy to see, but that's what it is. That's an interesting one. Bill pointed this out to me. Is that one that's been cut, Bill? Or not that one. We'll come to that. Okay, these, these are trees, fossilised trees. What have we got there? Sorry? A, a fern, yeah. It's a fern of some sort. That's another tree. Trees. Yeah, that's an interesting one. You see the tree's actually been cut and laid down and it's been fossilised. Now you have to recognise that fossilisation can, under certain, certain circumstances, occur in a very short period of time. It doesn't necessarily take a long period. So, yeah, I can't categorically say that that was there in the time of the flood. Yeah, see the footprint? I'll tell you the size of them some uh, in a little while. <laughs> now, fern. Okay, we, we might leave it there, Bill. How did you know what these were? What? You've seen? The same. Yeah, they actually call them living fossils because... They, they are fossils, all right, but we see them today, so we can recognise them. And that's what the, the Bible account says, that um, God said that the earth was to bring forth the living creatures after their kind. I'm going to have a quick look at what was Eden like. What was it like? We don't know absolutely, but we can get some indications. The evolutionists and evolutionists and the creationists were having a discussion one day about the um, coal deposits all around the world. And the evolutionists objected that the vegetation that we see in the world today was nowhere near enough to... to um, form the huge coal deposits that are still available on the earth, not even touched yet. 
it, it would need much more time. The evolution was looking for more time for that to happen. The creation was saying it's only 4,400 4, years. But things were different before the flood. There are fossils of vegetation, lots of them, ferns that today only grow to two metres high, grew to 30 metres high. Something was different about the environment. And we get some little bit of an indication from a dinosaur's nostrils. <laughs> Sounds strange, doesn't it? You imagine a, a dinosaur 80 feet long, they grew pretty big. Nostrils the size of a horse. Poor dinosaur, he's just about going to burn his nasal passages out trying to get sufficient oxygen into his lungs for a creature that size with nostrils only that big. That's if the... the uh, Dinosaur was living in today's in, in, in our environment today. And that may this may be a reason why we there wasn't as many dinosaurs after the flood as before. They died out. In the Bible account, God it says that God created a firmament separating the water under the firmament from the water above the firmament. That, so apparently there was water all around. It may even have been a, sh a shell of ice all around our Earth's in environment. Whichever way it was, if it was water or if it was ice, it would have created increased air pressure. Maybe even an air pressure of double what we have today. And this would have made it easier for the dinosaur to breathe because he had the assistance of the extra air pressure to get the amount of air that he required. Let's have a look at that one of those blocks of resin, Bill. They've tested sometimes these blocks of resin or Americans call it amber that they've found. Sometimes there's air bubbles inside them and they've carried out tests on the air bubbles in the, in the resin and they've found out something interesting. The oxygen level in the air bubble is 50% higher than the oxygen level that we have in our in our air today. Somebody, th this sort of thing, 50% more oxygen and double the air pressure would have created what they call hyperbaric conditions in the atmosphere before the flood. We use hyperbaric chambers in modern med medicine to treat some conditions. I've seen my wife locked away in a hyperbaric chamber where the oxygen levels were increased and the, it was, they simulated a, um, an air pressure of well, seven meters under the water or something like that. Yeah, and it worked. Somebody tried to grow cherry tomatoes in this sort of atmosphere. They simulated the atmosphere before the flood. 50% more oxygen, double the air pressure. They had to alter the building as the plant grew. It just grew too big. They had to change, I think they changed the building design a little bit couple of times during the life of the plant. Admittedly, it was a cherry tomato. Ultimately, in the end, they had picked 15,000 tomatoes off the plant. 15,000. And the size, 
cherry tomatoes, probably not a lot bigger than your thumbnail, eh? <laughs> I don't want to exaggerate, so I'm going to tell you that they were tennis ball size. But I seem to recall that I heard baseball. 15,000 tomatoes off the plant and that size. That was a plant in an atmosphere simulating what it was like prior to the flood. I was amazed, and this shows the length that the evolutionist will go to hide evidence that he doesn't want to see. I always wondered why I never heard about human skeletons or human fossils. The reason why, because they were spirited away when they were found into museums, the back rooms of museums. Because if you're looking for intermediary forms, life forms that indicated that we grew from an ape, <laughs> you're not going to want these perfect specimens of humans. You don't want to have them around, so they were spirited away. But there were human fossils and skeletons three to five metres high. And there's more than one of them. There's a number of them that have been found. There was one that was even a little bit bigger than that. Human jawbone that you could put your head inside and still have room to move your head. That's quite large. Footprints. Mum going to buy shoes for the kids for school. Footprints 400 to 500 millimetres long. You saw that. I might have told you. What, what's that one there? But that's a, yeah, that's a footprint. I told you it was a tree before. You can see the toe prints up the top. Yeah. I told you a wrong story there. Footprints 400 to 500 millimetres long. Strides, because they've found footsteps like this, strides two metres long. You try doing that. <laughs> try doing that. These were big people. Big people. And it's interesting that the footsteps, human footsteps, have been found in dinosaur footsteps. It was very convenient if the, if the, the ground is a bit soft, you walk where the big dinosaurs already walked. So the footsteps were actually in, in, the, in the footprint of the dinosaur. Okay. Genesis 6.4 says there were giants in those days. And even after the floods, this gene was still there because we have the Og, Og, who was king of Bashan, Bashan. His bed was his bed was four, over four meters long and two meters wide, and that's assuming that's working on the basis of the length of our arms today, that was the cubit from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. If they were bigger people, then they would have a different measurement again. So, yeah, it might have been much bigger than that. We could, um, we could sleep top and tail in this bed without our feet, our feet ever touching. <laughs> mm. God said... Let us make man in our image. Back then, I don't think they were the weeds we are today. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that of you. <laughs> I, I think they are much bigger. With that environment, their blood plasma would have been saturated with oxygen. They would be able to run and not tire. Noah's sons, Bill, they had no log handling equipment, but I'm sure they coped all right because they were big guys. They wouldn't have had, had too much trouble handling the equipment. Can you imagine cockroaches half a metre long? I don't like cockroaches. I don't like that one. <laughs> God must have had some purpose for them. But cockroaches half a metre long. Dragonflies, 1.2 metres wingspan. That's a four-foot wingspan. 
That's a big dragonfly. Kangaroo is three meters tall, beavers two and a half meters long, shark's teeth. Well, we don't see too many fossils of sharks because they, they, they don't have a skeleton like other fish do. So all we see of sharks is their teeth predominantly. But they've discovered teeth and they're not, not a few, a lot of them that are so big the shark would have had to have been something like 80 feet long, 25 meters long. They're big because they just keep growing and growing. Technology, back in those days, the evolutionist, when he's, he's looking for um, the missing link between apes and humans, he, he's also looking for the ability to make things. Uh, industry, things like that. These are the sort of things that have been pulled out of coal seams. Okay? Gold chain, fine gold chain. Iron mug, iron pot, bronze bell. Man was drilling for water. 30 metres down, he pulls up a doll. In Genesis 4 and verse 22, it refers to a man by the name of Tubalcain. He was an instructor of this, this sort of craft. There was technology back then. I believe that by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. There is nothing too hard for him. I believe also that he's going to create new heavens and a new earth. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I would invite you to stand for our last Is all nature sings and round me wings the music of the spirits. This is my father's truth. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, and the wonders. Father's will, the words that come.
kind of disappoint you. You sit down for a moment. I just realised while we were singing there, I turned over a page. Too many. And I'd like to tell you this. And Bill went to the trouble of getting it for me, so I'd like to tell you this. It won't take very long. Could we have a trailer bite, please, Bill? That's a trailer bite. They change a little bit as they get older. He's an interesting creature. He's made people think a lot. <laughs> What's special about the trilobite? His eyes. He's got amazing eyes. Absolutely incredible. I'll read just a few lines here. It, it says here, it, it is well known, this is a creationist writing, so he's being a little bit sarcastic. It is well known that extinct arthropods, this is an arthropod known as trilobites, occupy the ancient lower sediments of the geologic column. The first trilobites appeared in sediments dated by evolutionists at 520 million years ago. The upper part of the lower Cambrian, yeah, you don't need to know all that. So they, the evolutionist says that they occurred in the Cambrian, that's a, a, a level in the geologic column. They appeared there 520 million years ago. The interesting thing is that they've got amazing vision. Oh, I wish I could find it. Darwin said, said he actually noted in The Origin of Species, his book, the abrupt, notice the wording, the abrupt emergence of arthropods in the fossil record during the Cambrian represents a problem for evolu evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simpler or intermediate forms either living or in, the, or in the fossil record that show convincingly how modern arth arthropods evolved from worm-like ancestors. So he's saying they appeared there suddenly. There's no evidence of any evolution before that. The trilobite in his eyes has lenses, they're glass-like lenses, similar to glasses, different material, but they're actually glass-like lenses. If he had one lens in his eye, it would make it difficult for him to be able to focus on lengthwise. He'd only see a certain distance. He doesn't have one lens, he actually has a double lens. The second lens is to correct the problem that occurs if you've only got one. All right? I'm trying to explain it in my words anyway. This creature has got vision, which is very much like what I've got on. In fact, one of the... the you listen to this. The shapes of some trilobite lenses, in fact, match those derived by optical scientists over 300 million years later. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? I find that absolutely incredible that they would believe something like that. In actual fact, they, I had a statement. Oh, no. No, I can't find it, and I don't want to keep you from your lunch. But I had a statement there that by an evolutionist, and he said that the trilobite must have had knowledge of this law and this law and this formula. That's incredible thinking. It's supposed to be an intelligent man. 
the trilobite was created that way. That's why he suddenly appeared in the fossil record because that was how it was for the whole of creation. Just suddenly appeared there with perfect vision. He had hardly any distortion. He could see up close. He could see a long way away with these lenses that uh, built into his eyes. And that, I believe, is the hand of God. He engineered that. And I'm going to just finish this off. I, I haven't gone that much over that time. We find that there are, is what we call symbi symbiotic relationships in nature. There's weevils that eat wood, but they can't digest it. But they have a creature living inside them which eats the cell cellulose out of the wood. The two cannot live apart. One without the other, both ways, would die. They were created this way. That's how God created them. We see relationships like that with crocodiles with their mouths open, with birds hopping around cleaning their teeth. You see the rhinoceros with birds on his back. He's getting some creature off, off, off the rhinoceros. Those sort of things could be learned, but there are a whole host, there's thousands of, of symbi symbiotic relationships in, in nature that has just had to be created that way. I'll leave you there. Just bow our heads in prayer a moment. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you've revealed us, revealed to us yourself in your word. But not only there, Father, we, you've revealed yourself to us in nature. And we thank you for the fact that we can see the work of your hand there. And we thank you, Father, that you are coming back soon and you're going to take us home to heaven. You're going to build a new earth. We want to see that and we want to be ready for that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.